Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar hosted by the International Society for the Prevention of Child Abuse and Neglect. Today's webinar, presented by Dr. Fegan Shaheen Dagli, focuses on the importance of identifying children who are abused, neglected, or at risk of being abused or neglected, especially for healthcare providers, who are often the first ones to interact with these children and their families. Management of these cases requires multidisciplinary collaboration. Therefore, the referral of abused children for therapy, long-term follow-up, and protection is the next step in ensuring their well-being. In this webinar, Dr. Dogley will discuss these topics and share her experiences as a professor of pediatrics and one of the pioneers in founding and directing a child protection center at her university in Turkey. Hold on one moment. Okay, thank you. Right now I have everyone on mute to avoid background noise. We welcome you to enter your questions and comments in the chat box throughout the presentation. The presenter will answer any questions at the end as time permits. Fegan Shaheen Dagli is a professor of pediatrics at the Children's Hospital at Gazi University in Ankara, Turkey, as well as a trainer and consultant on various projects related to child abuse and neglect prevention. She has also served as director of the university's Child Protection Center, the first multidisciplinary hospital-based unit in the country, and has facilitated the formation of such teams in many other university hospitals. She has served as president of the Turkish Society for the Prevention of Child Abuse and Neglect, was co-chair of the 19th ISPAN International Congress on Child Abuse and Neglect in Istanbul, and currently serves as IS on ISPAN's Executive Council as chair of the Training and Education Committee. Fegan, we thank you for being with us today and for your many years of dedicated work protecting children. Now I will turn it over to you. Thank you, Heather. Um, it's a great honor and privilege for me to be in the Council of ISPIAN and to be um, with you, with the participants of this webinar. Um, thank you for this opportunity. Um, so um, before I start to uh, make sure that connection is good enough, I, I'd like to stop uh, sharing my webcam uh, to uh, increase the speed of my internet connection, if that's okay. We'll see you at the end. Okay. So today, uh, I'd like to talk about the role of the healthcare sector. Uh, in the identification and referral of violence cases, but also um, in the prevention of child abuse and neglect, uh, because healthcare sector has very important roles. Um, I can't go with the slides. I don't know why my screen has Stopped. At the bottom of the screen, uh, in the left lower corner, there should be arrows. There we go. On the far right, should be the, there we go. Yes. Okay. So uh, before I uh, pass to the role of healthcare sector, I'd like to talk a little bit about violence against children uh, because uh, this is uh, very important to know what the definition. When we talk about violence against children, uh, we know that it includes all forms of violence against people under 18. Uh, because everybody under 18 is uh, considered as a child and protection of children from all forms of violence is uh, a fundamental right stated in the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child. But despite uh, that fact, still 1 billion children globally experience some form of emotional, physical or sexual violence every year and um, one child in every five minutes dies as a result of violence. Um, we know that uh, United Nations uh, decided uh, in 2015 uh, in the General Assembly 
um, the Universal Integrated and Transformative 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. Um, sustainable Development Goals uh, are um, a plan of action, actually, uh, in a very large scale, and it's universal. Uh, and it has 17 goals, uh, which are critical uh, for humanity. They are very important. And among them uh, is the uh, Sustainable De Development Goal 16, uh, which uh, says uh, promote peaceful and inclusive uh, societies for sustainable development, provide access to justice for all, and build effective, accountable, and inclusive institutions at all levels. Um, in, uh, in, in accordance with these 17 Sustainable Development Goals, in this agenda, there are 169 targets, uh, and uh, beneath this uh, goal 16, there are 10 targets. One of the, those targets, target number two, um, is about ending all forms of violence against children. Uh, it says that it's a right of every child to live free from fear, uh, neglect, abuse, and exploitation. Uh, this target is the, uh, not the only target within these um, SDGs. There are also other targets that address specific forms of violence and harm towards children. For example, child marriage and female genital mutilation uh, are addressed in target uh, 5.3. And eradication of child labor, including recruitment and use of child soldiers, is also mentioned in target 8.7. Uh, and there is a global partnership uh, to end violence against children. Um, this, uh, in this partnership, uh, the board is composed of governments, civil society and faith-based organizations. And I have to say uh, proudly that uh, ISCAN is uh, within these uh, civil societies on the board. Uh, foundations, private sector, UN agencies, academia and independent experts are uh, all together working to end violence against children. Um, <clears throat> these uh, UN bodies uh, and global partnerships, uh, they created a guideline talking about seven strategies for ending violence against children. And it's called INSPIRE because of the acronym uh, of those uh, seven strategies, which are implementation and enforcement of laws, norms and values, safe environments, parent and caregiver support, income and economic strengthening, response and support services, education and life skills. Within these seven strategies, uh, some strategies are more related to healthcare sector. And in this guideline, uh, uh, the uh, sectors uh, which deal with which specific strategy are also identified. For example, implementation and enforcement of laws, of course, uh, is the responsibility of the justice sector. Uh, when we look at this uh, table, we see that uh, in three uh, strategies, namely norms and values, parent and caregiver support, response and support services, healthcare sector uh, is uh, accountable for uh, the actions that should be taken in these uh, strategies. Um, when we talk about infants and younger children, uh, Violence mainly involves child maltreatment. And this child maltreatment is uh, done mainly by parents or other authority figures uh, in the children's life. Uh, but when the age goes uh, a little bit uh, further, uh, when children reach adolescence, then other forms of violence may, be, uh, may become more prevalent in their lives, like peer violence, intimate partner violence. Um, but uh, in this presentation, I'll mainly talk about uh, the um, violence against infants and younger children, that is child maltreatment. And we know that child maltreatment is an important cause of mortality and morbidity, especially in the early years of life. And it has different forms 
physical, emotional, sexual abuse. These are classically known types of um, abuse. But I also would like to talk about a little bit uh, about shaken baby syndrome and Munchausen syndrome by proxy because these are the uh, maltreatment forms uh, that are uh, almost always uh, identified by uh, healthcare workers, not somebody else. Um, that's why I think these are important to know uh, and uh, this is the role of healthcare uh, providers to identify and refer to the services. Today, there is a patient population in which there is a high prevalence of child maltreatment, and we all know that um, the consequences of child maltreatment are very dramatic. Uh, both the immediate and long-term consequences are present, and sometimes the immediate consequences are um, life-threatening, so it may result in death of the child, and sometimes uh, it has long-term um, psychiatric problems. So it's very important for us to determine which form of abuse is there. Uh, we have to diagnose, intervene, and uh, best of, of them is, of course, prevention. Okay. Um, the classical um, staging of prevention of child maltreatment says that there is primary, secondary, and tertiary prevention activities. And primary prevention activities are directed at general population, the population with or without risk, everybody. And uh, these activities attempt to stop maltreatment before it occurs. In the second step, secondary prevention activities um, are offered to a um, high-risk uh, population. Uh, we have to know which risks increase child maltreatment. Uh, so we can provide some services to that, that high-risk group. Uh, but this is still the group where child maltreatment has not really occurred, but there is a risk of maltreatment. Um, in the tertiary prevention, uh, this is actually um, not a real prevention, but it's prevention uh, of recurrence of child maltreatment because uh, for the child, maltreatment has already occurred. and what we are trying to do is to decrease the negative consequences of the maltreatment and uh, to stop maltreatment by uh, taking some precautions uh, and we try to prevent its recurrence. Uh, when we talk about healthcare workers uh, in the area of pediatrics, uh, we're talking about pediatric clinicians. And uh, the main role of the pediatric clinicians is to promote the child's well-being. And uh, the parents need assistance to raise healthy, well-adjusted children. And this is what we all do as our primary role. Uh, depending on the health systems of different countries, the um, healthcare workers uh, of uh, pediatrics uh, might differ. Uh, in some uh, countries, uh, only family physicians or general, general practitioners work on the uh, first step. Um, but uh, in some others, uh, pediatricians, specialists also see the children uh, in the first line. Uh, so uh, in general, when I'm talking about pediatric clinicians, I'm um, involving all these uh, groups and also uh, nurses in their teams, of course, because in some countries, nurses uh, have uh, even more responsibility than physicians uh, in the care of children. Um, in addition to that, uh, main groups who um, see the uh, children uh, for their well-being or for their diseases, there are some other branches which also have pediatric patients. Um, for example, pediatric surgeons, their main patients are, of course, children. Um, orthopedic neurosurgeons, they not only see um, pediatric patients, they also see adult patients, but uh, they are the ones uh, we need when a child has a fracture, for example, or um, uh, when a baby has uh, subdural uh, bleeding because of shaken baby syndrome, we need neurosurgeons, ear, nose, and throat, ophthalmology, dermatology. These are all other branches that also see uh, pediatric patients. Uh, pediatric clinicians must be encouraged 
to play a role in preventing child maltreatment. This is, of course, our role, but sometimes we are so embedded in the medical part of it that um, we only try to cure the disease, we only deal with the medications, uh, but actually uh, we have a very important role in preventing child maltreatment. Actually, in all three steps we have a role, uh, like for primary prevention, well child care is the best opportunity to um, train uh, or uh, to provide anticipatory guidance for parents and uh, to help enhancing child development. Uh, in addition to that, we can also advocate, uh, advocate for policies and programs that support families and protect vulnerable children. Um, so we are in a position to do all these things, uh, which are actually the best uh, strategies uh, and help children before uh, abuse happens. Um, but here uh, in this presentation, I'll mainly talk about uh, the role of uh, pediatric clinicians in secondary prevention and tertiary prevention, uh, because um, to determine the risks of the um, abuse, of the probable abuse, uh, pediatric clinicians are uh, very key people and then they can intervene and refer uh, the parents uh, or families to programs and other resources with the goal of strengthening families. Um, in the tertiary prevention, uh, the uh, pediatric clinicians should identify a maltreated child and this is not always so easy and so obvious because sometimes it has a very subtle clinical presentation. Uh, so diagnosis may be a challenge and after the diagnosis also management uh, is another uh, challenge that physicians should be uh, very well trained on. So starting with secondary prevention activities, um, we have to determine the risks as said. These risks may be related to the family, to caregiver, or to the child. And then when we determine these risks, we can uh, intervene and refer these uh, risky families to programs. Uh, as I said before, the goal is to strengthen the family. Uh, which risks increase child abuse, these are actually very well known and studied largely in many researches. Uh, we know that uh, if the family has economical difficulties uh, because of especially unemployment, lack of education, this is uh, one of the biggest risks for child abuse. And a number of children at home uh, is very important. If there are uh, more children than the family can take care of, um, this increases abuse. Um, step parents uh, are risks, although it depends on the character of the step parents. Sometimes they are as well as uh, biologic parents, but um, it may increase the risk, especially if a good attachment is not present between the uh, step parents and the child. Uh, Interparental conflict and domestic violence. And uh, not only hurts the parents, but uh, also the children. It may cause physical abuse uh, in a child. If there is no physical violence uh, against that child, still there is an emotional part of it that uh, hurts the child. Uh, if uh, the child witnesses uh, interparental conflicts and uh, the violence, domestic violence at home, this is um, at least emotional uh, abuse for the child. And lack of social support, uh, which uh, is getting less and less in modern societies because we don't have uh, neighbors, relatives, friends as we had before. And this lack of social support uh, is a real risk for families. Uh, when we look at the individual caregiver, uh, if he or she has problem of alcohol and or substance abuse, uh, psychiatric problems, uh, history of violence in his or her childhood, uh, then these are uh, risky uh, parts uh, for that caregiver. 
And as well as these, um, another important factor is uh, if the caregiver has unreal expectations from the child, if, the, if they don't know what a child can do at a certain age, and for example, expect the child uh, to be toilet trained before age of one, or um, if uh, the parents don't know the um, temper uh, tantrums of a two-year-old, then uh, they may uh, be angry with the child, and uh, this also increases the risk of abuse in that family. Uh, the third part is uh, risks related to the child. Uh, sometimes uh, the parents, the family, uh, doesn't have this um, risks we have uh, talked about, but the child may be a product of an unwanted pregnancy. Uh, this may be an, in, uh, within the marriage. Um, sometimes the parents don't want any more children, or sometimes they are in a busy uh, time in their career, they don't want any children. Or sometimes it's even worse um, if the uh, couple is not married and they don't want to be together, but the uh, girl is pregnant. Uh, so. These are all uh, problems that uh, create a risk for the child. Um, if the child does not um, have the, does not fulfill the um, expectations of the parents, for example, a disabled child or a child who needs very special care, very small, premature baby, child with a chronic disease, etc., then uh, with this disappointment, uh, risk of um, abuse increases uh, for that child. Uh, a hyperactive child is always uh, very hard to deal with and children with behavioral problems uh, might be exposed to uh, emotional and physical abuse easily uh, because they, uh, they cause exhaustion in the parents. So uh, when we uh, identify the risks and refer the uh, families for strengthening, it's okay. But uh, if we come to the third step, uh, that means there is an abused child uh, and they present it uh, to the hospital for care. Uh, sometimes, and most of the times, uh, although the um, patient is uh, abused, the history does not reveal that. Uh, it, it's usually uh, a history of accident when they come to emergency or pediatrics. So the identification of abused and neglected children is the important step for tertiary prevention for healthcare workers. And after identifying them, uh, reporting is an important step. Um, in different countries, this reporting may be done to different agencies. In our country, in Turkey, we do double reporting to both child protection agencies and to law enforcement. Um, and then uh, there has to be a referral for services uh, because uh, both at the immediate term and in the long term, this child needs lots of things. Uh, psychiatric uh, treatments, so social supports, etc. So there must be a services, uh, a service provided uh, to those children. And as pediatric clinicians, we are the ones to uh, start these services by referring them to these areas. So let's start by uh, the ways how we can identify violence cases. Um, one of the methods is uh, screening tools. Uh, if we have some screening tools uh, during our clinical practice or for our researches, we can use these screening tools and um, identify these cases. And also we can um, search for uh, suspicious injuries and suspicious history of accident. But that means the healthcare provider should have a very good training about those. 
because as I said, in most of the times, uh, those cases never come with the history of abuse. No parent says that, uh, well, I hit my child and now uh, he is unconscious. They usually say there was an accident, the child fell down, so and then I found him like this. Um, and this, in our um, medical life, is one of the most uh, difficult uh, parts because we uh, are we tend to believe uh, in the history of what is told to us, but only in these cases we need to be we need to know more. Uh, uh, we need to uh, search for the um, physical uh, signs and symptoms and we must not believe in what's said to us as a history. Uh, pediatricians and uh, other medical professionals are often the first point of contact with abused children and their families. That's why it's so important for them to be uh, knowledgeable about the signs and symptoms and everything about child abuse. Uh, when I said uh, screening tools, um, I'd like to mention about a um, very nice model presented by Howard Dubowitz, uh, who's a former ISPIAN counselor. Uh, it is uh, a model called Safe Environment for Every Kid, uh, abbreviation is SEEK model. Uh, it's a primary pediatric care model to help uh, prevent child maltreatment. And this model consists of residents who receive special training. As I said, uh, special training is very important for physicians, for pediatricians um, in this topic. And then they have a parent screening questionnaire, a social worker working with the resident. And when much risk factors for child maltreatment are identified and addressed by the resident, uh, physician and or social worker, then uh, this is a screening and uh, they uh, refer the patients for uh, services. Another tool uh, which is uh, mostly used in research uh, area uh, is the ISCAN Child Abuse Screening Tool, ICAS. It has three versions. Uh, ICAS C is the child version, uh, it's for children uh, between 7 to 11 years old. ICAS P is the parent version, uh, parents of those uh, ICAS C uh, children. And uh, the third one is ICAST-R, retrospective uh, tool. Uh, this is uh, for people uh, over 18, uh, so we can do some retrospective research uh, asking uh, people around uh, 18, 20 years old. We did this research with university students, for example, uh, and ask about uh, their uh, abusive or their adverse childhood uh, events. Uh, this is important to um, identify the prevalence or incidence of abuse in a society. Uh, for ISCAN members, these tools are uh, for free, uh, so the, uh, our members can achieve these tools at no cost. Um, so in tertiary prevention, uh, we have to know when to suspect physical abuse. Let me summarize a little bit. Uh, the first thing is, as I said, uh, when the history is incompatible with the seriousness of injury. For example, uh, when the parents say the child fell off the bed and you see there are multiple fractures in the child and uh, we know that the height of a bed is uh, often not uh, so much uh, to cause such serious injuries uh, in that child. Uh, the, uh, maximum uh, injury we could expect from a fell from the bed is maybe a linear fracture of the skull but not multiple fractures of the uh, extremities or uh, depressed fracture of the skull is not expected for example. Um, another uh, suspicion is an injury incompatible with the developmental level of the child. That means uh, the younger the child the infant is uh, the less we expect a serious injury. For example, a two-month-old baby uh, cannot uh, roll over and cannot fall from the bed. Uh, if the parents say that uh, they found the ba uh, baby uh, fell, fell falling down the uh, bed, this is not compatible with the developmental level of the child. And also, 
there is a saying uh, if a child uh, does not cruise cannot bruise uh, so the children less than uh, one year of age or the ones who cannot walk uh, independently are not expected to have accidents fall falling accidents uh, that may cause very serious injuries in them um, and the um, bones of the children under one year of age are um, not easy to fracture because they are um, kind of elastic uh, and when they have uh, fractures it's kind of uh, green tree fracture so it's kind of elastic and then uh, fractures uh, if we have a serious fracture and there is no real explanation no um, logical explanation for that like a um, traffic car accident uh, then we must be suspicious about this if a child is uh, admitting to the hospital very frequently because of accidents all the time uh, it may be a result of a neglect, supervision neglect, so that parents are not taking care of that child, or uh, it may not be a real accident. And if the um, child is uh, not brought to the hospital immediately after the accident, which is the uh, usual way we expect when a child has an accident, the parents get concerned and bring the child to the hospital. But if they don't and the admission to hospital is delayed, uh, this may be due to uh, the parents' fear of being identified. Uh, but when the child's clinical condition gets worse, then they need to uh, take the child to the hospital. So delayed admission is also another uh, factor to be suspicious of. Um, usually, uh, violence at home is not limited to only one child, so history of frequent wounding in the siblings uh, should also raise our suspicion about abuse in that family. And if the uh, family have the risk factors that we talked about a, little, a few minutes ago, then uh, these all come together for us to be suspicious of physical abuse. Um, like you see in this picture, uh, this is a bruise that uh, is caused by pinching the child's arm. This is a bite. Uh, we have to measure the diameter of this mouth. This is not an animal bite because animal bites are um, completely different. They are more uh, elliptic and they have prominent uh, teeth on these sides, uh, can, canines. Uh, if this diameter is more than three centimeters, uh, we can say that this is an adult bite. Uh, if the parents insist that the child's uh, sister or brother did this, um, we can be sure uh, about the diameter of this uh, mouth. And as I said, if it's more than three centimeters, it's definitely an adult. If it's less than 2.5 centimeters, it might be a child. If the um, lesion uh, looks like the shape of a typical object, like this here, a ruler, and this shape is just the uh, shape of the ruler, then uh, we can say it is caused by that object. Uh, this scalding burns, uh, typical immersion uh, burns, uh, scalds, uh, let me say, uh, this cannot be done by accident because it's on both hands, it has a de definite border, and it's at very high degree of burn. Uh, the only explanation for that kind of burn is someone uh, put the arm uh, of that child and put both hands on boiling water and stood them there for a while. Um, this is also an immersion uh, sculpt uh, done because of the anger, uh, the child has uh, toilet training and could not hold uh, the defecation. Uh, so the parents were angry and put her to the boiling water. So in identifying uh, abused or neglected children, um, depending on the neglect or abuse uh, type, uh, we might see some symptoms uh, 
I will not go very much in detail, but for neglect, for example, uh, if you see signs of malnutrition and poor hygiene in a child, uh, and you cannot explain it by the socioeconomic uh, status of the family, uh, and if you think the child is not uh, fed well enough uh, because the parents are neglecting them, uh, and also, if the child uh, has some physical or medical problems and not taken to the um, hospital or doctor for those uh, things, then we also talk about medical neglect. In physical abuse, as I uh, talked deeply, unexplained bruises, burns, welts. Uh, and if the child has um, clothing worn to cover bruises, uh, then we might be suspicious. Uh, for sexual abuse, uh, there are some physical signs that are suspicious and also uh, in most of the times there are not many uh, physical signs, but uh, we can suspect from the behavior of the child uh, that there's something wrong with uh, her or him. For example, age inappropriate sexual play with toys or with other children or with adults. Uh, is an important sign uh, that the child is exposed to some sexual events or also um, age inappropriate knowledge of sex uh, for a, a small child uh, is very important to uh, understand the reason um, and sometimes the child may have pain bleeding redness or swelling in the genital area genital area um, these are not uh, specific to child abuse, of course. There are other reasons to cause these. Uh, but if we combine them with uh, the history or the uh, interview with the child, we may uh, understand, we may diagnose sexual abuse. And uh, lastly, emotional abuse may have some signs uh, that, that may be delayed physical, emotional or intellectual development. Uh, extremes in behavior ranging from overly aggressive to overly passive, self-harm behavior, lack of joy or interest in play. Um, as I said in the beginning of my presentation, there are two types of abuse uh, that are uh, specific and can be diagnosed uh, maybe only by the um, healthcare staff. Uh, one of them is shaken baby syndrome or uh, abusive head trauma, which is a specific form of physical abuse caused by forcefully and violently shaking a baby. And uh, that results in a serious brain injury. Uh, this is most commonly uh, seen in infants, uh, although it can affect children less than five years of age. It's usually seen um, uh, during the time when the infants have uh, infantile colic uh, and cry a lot, uh, these are uh, less than three months of old, three months of old babies. And uh, shaken baby syndrome uh, is most commonly seen around six to eight weeks of age. Uh, the trigger of shaken baby syndrome is the crying infant, and the um, angry or frustrated. Uh, caregiver, uh, if especially he is a male, uh, because they are stronger, uh, tries to uh, uh, make the infant uh, not shout, and with this anger, shakes the child violently. And during this shake, uh, the infant's head rotates and goes front and back, and this movement may go up to 240 degrees um, and this results in subdural and or subarachnoid bleeding, retinal bleeding, but when we look from outside uh, at the head we can't see any other uh, injuries and um, interestingly the history is very incompatible with the situation. It's usually while well, the infant was crying suddenly he stopped breathing and became cyanotic uh, so we took the infant to the hospital, but the part that's missing in this history is that he was crying and then we got mad and uh, shook the infant uh, violently, then he stopped breathing and became cyanotic. Why does it happen in infants? 
uh, because the skull and brain of children under four or five years of age are developmentally different from uh, those of adults. Uh, the skull is thinner, head is greater uh, in proportion uh, when compared with adults. Um, their brain is softer because their axons are not myelinized and uh, that's why they're also more prone to rupture and the real neurologic signs are because of this axonal uh, ruptures the um, axonal injury um, and the head is big compared to body and compared to adults uh, but neck muscles are weaker uh, especially around two three months of age uh, the infants cannot uh, hold their neck muscles strongly so the head is more prone to uh, this rotational uh, movements and what we have to know about shaken baby syndrome is that um, probably uh, many doctors miss many cases because um, sometimes uh, in mild cases the symptoms are very non-specific and the parents come to the emergency department or the pediatric departments uh, with the um, symptoms of uh, crying infant, irritable infant, vomiting infant, uh, and when we uh, see an infant crying a lot. Uh, thinking about shaken baby syndrome is not uh, one of our first diagnoses. We usually check for other reasons like urinary tract infection and others. <clears throat> but uh, when the um, clinical uh, symptoms are very severe, like lethargic coma and uh, convulsions, then uh, we start thinking about uh, this uh, diagnosis. And the last one I'd like to talk about is Minchazan syndrome by proxy, which is a specific form of abuse. Um, in this, there is uh, either exaggeration or fabrication of illness um, that is created by the primary caretaker, which is usually the mother. Uh, and actually the mm, caretaker misleads medical professionals uh, saying that the child has some symptoms. Um, so the doctors trying to diagnose the uh, reason of this, these symptoms, they do some invasive procedures to the child, sometimes hospitalized, sometimes do colonoscopies, etc. And uh, actually uh, the doctors are the ones who are really abusing the child. That's why uh, the syndrome is also known as medical child abuse or another uh, name is fabricated or in, in, induced illness. Uh, this is uh, one of the most difficult cases to me uh, to diagnose in the area of child abuse uh, because it's a real diagnostic challenge. And the most common signs and symptoms uh, in this syndrome are apnea, seizures, bleeding, unconsciousness or lethargy, diarrhea, vomiting, fever, rash. Uh, they either uh, create these symptoms or lie about the presence of these symptoms. This is the first case reported in Turkey and <clears throat> it was our case uh, which took for us to diagnose um, it took us a, almost a year uh, she was a four month old female and her mother brought her uh, to us with a symptom of recurrent gross rectal bleeding and the uh, blood in the diaper was so much uh, that uh, gastroenterology department needed all investigations uh, involving the invasive ones, colonoscopy, rectoscopy, and they were all normal and the infant looked so well compared to uh, um, an infant who, are, who is losing that much amount of blood from the diaper. Um, only after one year uh, we could uh, diagnose this case and the diagnosis was done by uh, analyzing the blood uh, that's in the diaper and in the diaper the DNA analysis of the blood said that it doesn't belong to that child. So that was uh, first case uh, and I remember how hard it was for all of us, for me, to diagnose and to manage. Uh, this is uh, a story of a survivor of Munchausen by proxy published in 1997 in Pediatrics. Uh, that was very interesting to me <clears throat> when I first learned about this syndrome and started reading about all these stories. So when, to, when should we suspect about this syndrome? Um, when a child has 
multiple medical problems that uh, don't respond to treatment or uh, that follow a persistent or puzzling course. And the physical and laboratory findings are highly unusual most of the times and they don't correspond with the child's medical history. Or sometimes there are uh, so, res uh, so different results that are clinically or physically impossible, like the uh, blood uh, in our baby's diaper. That was <clears throat> clinically impossible uh, amount uh, when the, the clinical situation of the child was taken care of. Sorry. And the most important um, suspicious factor is that <clears throat> When the perpetrator, usually the mother, is not with the child, the symptoms tend to stop. So uh, but, uh, maybe the best way to uh, diagnose uh, is to hospitalize the child without mother accompanying the child. So when you see uh, the infant is not with the mother and the symptoms stop, uh, then you may be uh, thinking of this syndrome and it's caused by the mother. And usually these parents are not reassured by good news when there is no medical problem. Uh, and when you try to discharge them from the hospital, then uh, the symptoms they admitted with recur uh, because the mother doesn't want to go uh, out of the hospital. And usually these parents are medically knowledgeable and they are overly supportive and encouraging to the doctor. Uh, and these mothers, usually, they themselves have unexplained medical conditions too. And there are similar situations in other children of the family and there are unexplained child deaths in the family. So the pediatricians need a very high index of suspicion in these cases. Um, and this is uh, very important. This is not merely a mental health problem uh, and there is extremely a problem of um, possibility of um, extremely poor prognosis, uh, like that of the child, uh, if he or she is left with that caregiver. So as you see, identifying uh, is a very important step and we have to be very uh, well trained in this uh, area. Um, but after identifying the systems, the child protection systems uh, should come uh, into the seen and uh, their collaboration and cooperation is very important. Uh, as I said, we in Turkey, we have to report to child protection services and to law enforcement both. And uh, this is very challenging decision uh, for most professionals because reporting to the law enforcement means um, accusing the parents and which may cause uh, trouble for the Positions. And if they are not sure, uh, they are only suspecting that, um, it's not easy uh, to decide to report to police. And it, uh, as I said, if the system does not work smoothly and for the best interest of the child, uh, the system also may cause secondary trauma to the child. And for referral to services, um, psychological and uh, psychiatric support is important bo both for the parents and for the child because the parents are always uh, very much um, affected by the abuse uh, or if they are the perpetrators, they must be treated uh, for their anger management or for their psychiatric illness if there is one. Social support, support of uh, the child at school, these are all very important. And um, the um, clinician, if they have direct links with these services, uh, it's the best option. And the best to provide the best, um, to get the best results, uh, the integration of services and collaboration among providers is essential. And in the last few minutes, I'd like to talk about a model we have in Turkey. This is university-based child protection centers. Um, which is uh, attached to the uh, governance of the university directorate and it involves all faculties of that university. But the child protection unit is located within the hospital of faculty of medicine. Uh, and this was a project uh, by, uh, supported by UNICEF and in these blue dots uh, the provinces where we established these child protection uh, centers in the universities. 
Uh, in this model, uh, the hospital organization uh, consists of a child protection team uh, with a pediatrician, psychologist, child psychiatrist, social worker, and nurse. And other uh, departments, other branches are in the outer circle, but they're also involved. And uh, evaluation and management of those abused children are done within this unit. This is the picture of our unit in Gazi University. Uh, there is an interview room separated from the um, watching room by a mirror, one-sided mirror. This is another picture from another, another center, Marmara University in Istanbul. And this is monitoring meeting room. And this child protection team, when they get referrals, uh, they do the first evaluation. Uh, and after the first evaluation um, of the pediatrician, of the um, psychiatrist uh, and social worker, nurse, whatever, the team meets and they make a plan for follow-up. Because um, the mm, needs of the child does not stop uh, when the reporting is done. Uh, of course, reports should be done by that team, but also how we should follow up should be decided together and in collaboration with people. So in conclusion, healthcare systems are very important for identification and referral of abused and or neglected children. And uh, these systems must move toward integration of services for families, including the community services. It's not enough to simply screen someone for depression or adverse childhood experiences and tell them, yes, you have to seek some um, help uh, because you're screened positive. This is not the best practice. Rather, um, it's increasingly accountable to provide more direct links to services in uh, behavioral health for both parents and children, whether through direct partnership with providers or more efficient processes of referral. I'd like to thank you all for uh, participating in this webinar and uh, I'll give the uh, theme to Heather once again uh, to uh, see if you have any uh, questions or comments. Thank you. Heather, I can't hear you. I don't know if anyone else can hear you. Oh, sorry about that. <laughs> okay. Ah, good. <laughs> sorry about that. Thank you, Fegan, um, for sharing this information with us today. Um, we have a couple of minutes for um, some quick questions. Um, the first one is about uh, reporting cases of um, neglect or emotional abuse. Um, mm -hmm. Are those handled in the same way or different? Uh, for health sector uh, providers, you know, than physical abuse or sexual abuse? Mm -hmm. Well, if the neglect and emotional abuse um, causes a problem in the child, which actually they cause, but for emotional, uh, neglect, um, emotional abuse cases, it's not uh, always easy to prove that it's very harmful for that child because most of the emotional abuse cases Mm, are considered within the discipline practice. Uh, this is kind of uh, parents' rights to shout at or to threaten the child to um, help them uh, be better children, let's say. Um, so um, actually uh, in our laws, uh, they have uh, some uh, act um, about this emotional abuse uh, cases but uh, as far as I know uh, we don't report those emotional abuse cases to unless it's very very severe and cause uh, real problems uh, in the child uh, but we try to uh, manage it uh, 
um, with parent training and uh, if the neglect is uh, uh, also uh, can be deal better with uh, training the parents or helping the parents, uh, strengthening them. Um, I don't usually uh, prefer to uh, report them to police because most of the times it is of no use. Okay, all right, thank you. Um, and here's another question. Um, our audience is from uh, you know several different countries and you mentioned that in Turkey you do have mandatory reporting for healthcare mm -hmm. providers. Um, but I'm wondering how, what, what can you suggest for healthcare providers who work in countries where there is no mandatory reporting or perhaps even no national laws regarding child abuse and neglect? What, what can their role be in the identification and referral of these cases? Um, although it's um, not mandatory for reporting, we have to be um, um, thinking uh, that uh, reporting to other uh, services like social welfare systems, for example, uh, actually these are the ones who um, are most responsible for protecting the child to prevention of child. So um, uh, it doesn't have to be mandatory to report. If we are taking the best interests of the child, uh, we um, have to collaborate with uh, those available services, whatever these are in our countries, uh, and uh, try to protect the children uh, in the best way that we can. Um, I think um, sometimes the healthcare system may be the pioneer. Uh, if the other systems are not as strong as a uh, healthcare system, uh, they might uh, start these uh, teams, uh, as I showed in the example of uh, Turkey's child protection uh, units in the universities. Um, in Turkey, uh, social uh, welfare system was not uh, as strong when we first started these university uh, child protection units. Um, but then when um, then the uh, risk resources, human resources and economic resources of uh, social welfare system developed a little bit. And when we collaborate with those um, other professionals, this is a motivation for all of us, actually. And um, the ones who are in desperate uh, positions because of lack of uh, resources or lack of support from um, other colleagues, uh, they become uh, better professionals uh, when we uh, collaborate and when we have meetings uh, for the best interest of the child. And it's really um, satisfying feeling when you really see that you could help that child. Uh, that's why I would recommend uh, those colleagues from other countries, if they don't have a good system in their countries, uh, they should not be depressed and uh, leave uh, it's all. Um, they should uh, be uh, trying to build a system uh, and do the best they can do, uh, create a little team around themselves with social uh, worker, maybe psychologists, psychiatrists, uh, police. Uh, if we uh, come and form a little team, uh, then we are more strong. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, I think we have time maybe for one more question. Um, this one is regarding uh, sexual abuse. The question is, how do you manage cases of juvenile sex offenders? Do you report these cases ma as mandatory? Yes, uh, we have to. According to our law, um, um, if the child, uh, the offender is not less than 12, which is not usual, only the children under 12 are not um, uh, uh, well, how can I say, uh, are not investigated by the police. Uh, but if the offender is around uh, 15 to 18, um, they are also subject to um, sentence uh, of the court. Uh, so we um, have to report them, uh, but uh, they are uh, evaluated in a special manner because they are also children. And, and in our country's law, um, there is a um, um, hard uh, part. Um, the sexual uh, act, although it involves peer relations, like 
16 year old boy and 15 year old girl uh, uh, in many countries, this is not considered as a crime because it's a pure sexual act. But in our country, um, there is no difference between um, an adult and a child or a peer uh, sexual uh, contact. If uh, the child uh, is uh, says that this is a sexual uh, offense, uh, then whatever the age of the perpetrator is, uh, then uh, they are subject to punishment. Okay, thank you. Okay, that's about all the time we have today. So thank you everyone for your questions. And again, to uh, Dr. Dagli for being with us today. Um, a recording of this webinar and a PDF version of the slides will be available on the ISPCAN website within 24 hours. We encourage you to become a member of ISPCAN so that we can continue offering informational webinars like these. If you are interested in presenting or have ideas for topics, please contact us at resources at ispcan.org. We would also like to take this opportunity to invite you to join us in Prague, September 2nd to the 5th for our 22nd International Congress. Registration is open on the conference website at ispcan2018.org. Thank you again for your time today, and we hope you all have a good day or night, depending on where you are. Bye. Bye-bye.